Well, while while people are logging on, we'll we'll get started. It's it's so great to to see everybody here. A lot of friendly faces and a lot of of new faces too. Uh, wanted to welcome you to our navigation series today. Um, I'm Brent Never. I am director of the Midwest Center for Nonprofit Leadership, um, and we're just very excited to have our our discussion today on putting DEI to work. Um, I know this has been a regional conversation for quite a while. I know that uh, all of us are trying to engage it in one way or another, and I'm just very excited to to have this opportunity to speak with. Uh, Erwin de Leon, um, who's a, a good friend uh, and an expert on, on DEI in the nonprofit sector. So um, I did want to uh, say that this is part of a, a series that we're working on. So Erwin will be presenting today, and uh, I hope and, and believe that you're going to really enjoy it uh, on July 28th. We'll also be having a day long, long session um, on putting DEI to work. Uh, and so for you, your organization, your board, whomever, uh, you really want to, to knuckle down and, and engage this subject, uh, I encourage you to think about the July 28th event. We'll pr provide you more information on uh, the July 28th event um, in an email right after, uh, after this. So um, please do think about that. With that, I do want to introduce you to a good friend, Erwin de Leon. Um, I've, I've worked with Erwin and been friends with Erwin for uh, quite a while now. Um, in fact, we published together, um, but uh, he is a uh, lecturer and also the chief diversity officer at the School of Professional Studies at Columbia University in New York City. Um, he is an active um, uh, thought leader and also a practitioner of DEI uh, around the country and internationally. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Erwin. I am going to encourage you to pop in any questions you have right into the chat. Um, I will be aggregating those and we're, we'll have a discussion after Erwin is, has done his presentation. So feel th free to pop them in there whenever, whenever they come to you. So Erwin, go, go yes. for it. Well, thank you. Well, first of all, thank you, Brent and your team, Monica and Mark, for having me and for everyone who's taking the time off your busy schedule to actually listen to me. Brent was very generous in his descriptions, but uh, I appreciate it. So let me begin by sharing my slides because we all have to have slides here. So I'm. can everybody see this fine? All right. So basically, this, this uh, presentation is taken from a course that I developed and teach actually for an entire semester. So this is just, if you will, a taste. And if I haven't scared you yet and you come back uh, end of July, we're going to discuss and really hash this out. So the, the course itself is called DEI at Work, Leading Inclusive Organizations. And the course looks at the different business functions uh, of any organizations, for-profit, non-profit, public, because as you all know, organizations uh, share similar business functions. But here's our, uh, let me see if I can, our agenda for today. It's a bit ambitious. I tend to be air more on the side of having too many slides and too many agenda points. And so we'll see how it goes and we'll see how far we can get into this. I'll just quickly uh, tell you about my own background, just so you, you understand my perspective and how I approach both uh, DEI practice as well as nonprofit practice. We'll talk about what we mean exactly, right? We, we all say DEI, DIA, DIB, JEDI. I mean, there's so many things, but what do we mean exactly by that? And then there are three key questions that I think everyone should really ask, that we should all ask ourselves. And then finally, what do we mean by practicing DEI? And I will share with you a framework that I use and I teach my students for the practice of DEI. And if we do get to the final two topics, optimizing data, which for me is foundational, you really need to understand uh, where you're at and where you need to go. And then managing diverse teams. So let's jump at it. 
So quickly, these are the three schools that are really very influential to me. So the first logo is from a, a Jesuit university in the Philippines where I graduated with a Bachelor of Science in Management Engineering. But I also went through good old <laughs> uh, Catholic boys school education from, from, you know, all the way. And so the reason I shared it, yes, I'm proud of it, but more than anything, it was this education that really instilled in me a sense of serving others, as well as a sense that all of, all people are to be valued and have dignity. So that's where my core values were formed. So it's very foundational to me. And then for my master's in nonprofit management and my PhD in public policy, I got that at the new school, which is not totally new. Uh, it's been around well over 100 years uh, in New York. Some of you might have heard of it. It's really well, uh, better known in the social science field. And during the early 20th century, a lot of the German intellectuals and others being persecuted in Europe found refuge in the new school. And then finally, uh, at Columbia University. So not only do I teach there and serve as the Chief Diversity Officer of the School of Professional Studies, I am actually a graduate student as well uh, in the bioethics program, because I figured, why not tuition reimbursement? Let's go for it. Um, but I, I do care about ethics and it's an interesting topic. So yes, Shannon, I can see you at least. Yeah, yes, absolutely. So you get it. Now, in terms of my background, um, I've been around for a while. I've been working for well over three decades, but here are just some logos of nonprofit organizations that I worked for. Uh, prior to that, I was in, have some, I worked in small business, ran a small business, but since this is a nonprofit crowd, just to quickly, some of the organizations I worked at is Episcopal Relief and Development, which is an international uh, relief organization. I worked at Aspen Institute, which like Urban Institute is a think tank, but I spent eight years at Urban Institute as a policy research policy researcher, a lot on evaluation, what have you. I uh, served for a while as a, well, a 40 year intern, long story at Human Rights Campaign. But the other things here, ICPH, uh, it's the about child poverty and homelessness. The other two, the Filipino Veterans Recognition and Education Project and the Ramon Magsaysay Awards Foundation, I'm, I'm rather proud of because the first one, the Filipino Veterans Recognition Education Project, uh, I was part of the founding board and we really worked hard at getting the Congressional Gold Medal for Filipino veterans because among, uh, at, among minorities in the US at that time, uh, the Filipinos were the last ones who had not received a gold congressional gold medal. So that that's really something I'm very proud of. And then the Magsaysay Awards Foundation, I say it's like Asia's version of the MacArthur Award, where they give awards to folks in civil society across Asia. So a year ago, I helped them come up with uh, a develop a leadership program for leaders across Asia. And of course, at Columbia University, you already heard where I am a, fu a full-time faculty member in the nonprofit management program where I teach, among other things, uh, 2DI courses, data analytics and metrics, ethics, capstone, in other words, most anything and everything about nonprofit management and leadership. And right now, I also help with the LGBTQ Center here in New York with their working group, the board's working group on race and equity. So this is to say that I approach this practice more from a uh, management and leadership perspective, because those of, of those who, who are in this space uh, would exactly be that, be an administration or folks with organizational psychology uh, background, organizational change background and all that. So before I start, if we can launch the first poll actually, um, I would like to know, does your organization have a DEI initiative? And among those that do have, when was it launched? Interesting, yeah. Super. So it looks like eight out of 10, excellent, have a DEI initiative. And not surprising, right? Uh, a number of us, more than half, launch it after 2020. And in a way, for, honestly, that's not surprising because that's even I, you know, even 
my school, the School of Professional Studies, along with half of Columbia University's schools, because there are 13, not counting affiliated institutions, did not have a DEI initiative until, unfortunately, the murder of George Floyd. And suddenly, you know, uh, organizations, both for profits and nonprofits, realized that it's long overdue, that work needs to be done in this space. So uh, we're all learning. I, you know, I, while I appreciate Brad calling me an expert in DEI, I sort of uh, wins because I think we're still all learning about what does this mean? And even our understandings of diversity, equity, inclusion still continue to change. And so I want to start asking for those, well, anyone really, please feel free to just chime in or raise your hand. What do you understand by diversity? What do you mean by equity? What do you mean by inclusion? Because these are all three different things. Any takers, one each? Brent, do you see the hands or is anyone offering their hand? <laughs> yeah, I can I can jump in on this one. Uh, Please, yeah. Justin Pippins, I'm from Southwest Missouri area. But I, I kind of look at it as recognition, retention, and um, just a retaining, attracting and retaining okay. either your employees or your volunteers or things of that nature. Um, I know sometimes people like to get caught up on the words and, yes. you know, equity means I'm being left out of this or what is, you know, the inclusion, we're all inclusive and yada, yada. It's like, no, you really have to drill down into those words and, right. and, and, and live that. You yes. can't um, just hire someone or just have a diverse friend and think that, oh, I'm diverse or we're inclusive or, you know, we, mm -hmm. we're equity. Everybody Correct. needs something a little different. Correct. So it's um, it's just a matter of well, a good example I like to use is is well, an organization gave everybody a, a pair of size ten shoes. Well, maybe somebody needed a size twelve or a size Thank eight you. or a size nine, Perfect. and that's kind of what the equity is, is. Yes. Everybody's needs are a little different. Yes. Yes. Thank you. And yeah, you you really dug into it, right? And it's really, it's very important that we do understand because these terms are being tossed around, right? And what do we mean by it exactly? So thank you. Um, anyone else? Maybe we'll take two more or Brent, anyone else? I can't really see whose hands are raised or, so, but if anyone, yeah. Yeah, um, I think that from my understanding, which is evolving is it's like a culture of, vision for an organization like trying to slowly change yes. like what we value so that's kind of how i see it yes you know yes to both right it, it, it so they are all parts of what we're doing here and it is about organizational change which really reflects societal change because underlying all this, regardless of where we're coming from, it really stems from what's going on or what needs to be taken care of in society, right? But it is about change. So unless there's someone else, I will move on. Okay, so let's see now. Okay, here, this is where, <laughs> let me show you. So, this is an example. So this, by the way, you'll have uh, images of certain guides that are available online if you look it up, but I'd be happy to send the links as well at some point. But this is a guide that our school brought, uh, came up with, and it, beyond just a, gl a glossary, it also talks about how to use language. But you'll notice like such a long, and if you look at different schools or even different corporations, the way people define diversity, it can get rather lengthy. <laughs> but at, at, at essence, it's basically first diversity is about uh, the different, if you will, identity groups, the different social groups, the different ways we all differ, right? So we always think about, uh, we start with race and gender, race, ethnicity, and gender, then eventually toss in uh, neurodiversity. There's so many ways you can cut and dice this, right? But an, another aspect of diversity is that it is all inclusive and supportive of the proposition that everyone and every group should be valued. So I think I've highlighted that because I think that's very important, right? Like it's not just the sake of like, well, okay, let's just put, let's just get X number of you, whatever it is, right? So that 
that's what diversity is. And I, I think I wouldn't be surprised if many in this call, and also I, it speaks even to, to my university, where diversity is still stuck on race, ethnicity, and gender. We have a long way to go with other, uh, other categories or social groups. So that's diversity. And then equity is exactly what was said earlier, right? That people are provided resources to succeed, right? But it's not the same amount for everyone. And there's this image, let me just show you, which you've probably seen some versions of this, right? Where folks are trying to, I think the one that's out there too, where you've got uh, some kids trying to look at the baseball field and one's more than the other. So from the left, you're seeing that equally, right? So, and then in the middle is what we really mean by equitable. So what does that mean in your organizations, right? So when you think of just staff and you, when you talk about retaining and promoting, now the reality is all our staff members, even in a particular team or on a particular, if you will, level, right? And doing the same job or what, but they come with different backgrounds, different abilities, different capacities, and some, you know, might need uh, support in some ways or what. But if you only give your staff the same thing, right, to succeed, and they would argue, well, I'm treating everyone equally, that might not be the best place to start at, right? You have to recognize if we're talking about diversity, we have to recognize the fact that we're all starting at the different points. And we want, if our goal is to really help folks succeed and do well in their work and to thrive, and we really believe in equity, then we have to, to give different kinds of support. And doesn't mean one is necessarily better than the other or more than the other, right? So what I like about this image, which is from Deloitte, the large humongous consulting firm, is that they add this third panel, right? This is really what well, we dream, we aspire that it will come to a point where there are no barriers. Again, uh, it's a dream, it's an ideal. All right. By the way, if anyone has any questions, please feel free to interrupt me. I, you know, I'd rather we have a conversation than me just droning on, which I can do. My students tell me. Okay. Now, inclusion. So, inclusion, it, this is the shortest definition we have, right? Uh, it's bringing traditionally excluded groups or individuals into everything, right? And, and not only that, that everyone shares in the power, right? In the power dynamics, in the decisions being made. So you might have an organization that, yes, we, we have, you know, right, we have so many folks of color, we have women, we have bi uh, LGBTQ and everything, but that's excellent. That's a start. But does everyone really share in the decision making in, 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 in you know, in, in just day to day deciding even have the having the um, the choice of, of how how to be at work. So there you go. So that's DEI. Any questions at this point? And I know there are other terms that we won't even get into, but we can. Okay, Leslie Scott, please. Yeah, I, I've seen, and this is probably um, related to what you just said, so my apologies, but um, okay. belonging is um, another yes. word that I've seen kind of added. Um, it, it feels like it, it's the, um, it's a key component to me because- yes organizations like the DEI is kind of like the organization or institution side of it and the belonging feels like how effective are those three things to the people yes um who who are, are being uh, marginalized so I just wanted to get your thoughts on that yeah two things so Leslie thank you um so first you will see a lot of acronyms. For instance, in, in our school, it's actually DEIA. You'll notice there diversity, inclusion, and accessibility because someone felt really strongly that yes, uh, you, you know, you can say that, well, that's part of, the, you know, of uh, diversity and inclusion, but it's highlighting that fact of accessibility. Belonging, I totally agree with you, is, is key at the end of the day. And that's really 
what we're doing here. In one of the slides, there's one that expressly talks about belonging because as you said, if we succeeded the D, the E, and the I, then everyone, and that's the goal, everyone in the organization feels like they belong, right? And they belong, that their whole selves belong. So you're absolutely spot on. Now, there actually is an article that came out, if you all are interested, uh, the past couple of days. But even the terms, as you can imagine, a lot of these terms can really get, uh, have different interpretations and can, can also be controversial, even belonging, believe it or not. So the New York Times came up with an article where now, and some of you, I see Brent's nodding his head, might have read this, where, you know, there are some folks who actually, um, yes, definitely we want to focus on belonging, but belonging not only of those who are traditionally and still to this day are marginalized, but everyone. And I think including those, you know, those who are traditionally in power. And I think that's where some people wait, will say, wait, hold up, right? Like, if that's what we mean by belonging, then that's not what we mean, <laughs> right? So however, the argument for it, like personally where I stand on this is that belonging is for everyone. I am not at any point saying that there's not a lot of work to be done to make it right for traditionally mar marginalized folks, people of color, women, uh, LGBTQ+, plus, uh, disabled folks. I'm not saying that for one second. But what I'm saying is, as an organization, I also feel strongly believe that each and everyone should feel like they belong, including our straight white male colleagues, right? Uh, because here's the thing. It doesn't help when we have colleagues or stakeholders who just clam up or scared and then at best they don't do anything at worst some might even sabotage the work so it's just something to think about uh and you know even the use of the terms so i'd be so end of the day if you were to use any term beyond dei it's best to be as clear as you can <laughs> Right, like so, whether you're anyway, I can go on and on about this, but that is something that we can definitely dive into uh, in July, right? Like the use of language. Okay, so anyone else? Just by the way, there's DIB, there's DIJ for justice, there's even Jedi. So putting justice before equity. So there are many ways to do it. And I, the only reason I use DEI, because it's a language that most people recognize right away. And globally, by the way, this is a very, the E part, the B, the J, that's a very US-centric model. The rest of the world, it's D and I. So just as an aside, because I get students from, you know, uh, domestic as well as international and the understanding about this work is very different. But anyway, so I'll try to get back on track here. So let's see, next slide. So I want to start off with this. Whenever anyone approaches me and says like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm interested in doing DEI or already doing DEI, great. But I invite everyone to actually pause and really think about this as individuals, as individuals, and as organizations. Why are you doing this? For whom and how, right? So for instance, for me, I already sort of shared this earlier. I'm doing it because it, it, it's my, one of my core values. I believe that each individual, we're all created equal and we should be valued and treated with dignity. For whom do I do this? Well, as CDO, I do it for my colleagues and the students and, and faculty, but also I also realize that this is part of a larger hard work that we have to do to come up with equitable, you know, and work in, in society and how, of course, that's where there are a number of ways to do it. That's me as an individual, but then as an organization, now as the organization I represent, the why was clear because George Floyd was killed. I mean, it, you know, I'm simplifying it, but if we were to be honest, how many of our organizations, for-profit or non-profit, really got into this, right? 
and for whom? Is it just for show? Is it for the stakeholders? And by the way, I'm the only reason I'm saying this is it's because it's best that at least there's some honesty and also setting expectations and being clear about what we mean. So again, I'll, I'll speak to my, uh, my own experience. And this is fairly recent that, so when I was asked to serve, I came from a slightly different angle. And so I was surprised recently to find out that the focus is really just on the D, right? Because it's, it's the checkbox, if you will. So I highly encourage folks uh, individually to reflect on these three, three questions, but also leadership in your organizations. You don't have to advertise this or say it, but you know you can have honest closed door meetings, but be clear amongst your leadership. Why are you doing this? If it's because you feel pressured, then okay, that's fine. But at least you all know where you're all coming from because it's very, I've seen this where you have folks on the same board, or even the same leadership team. And then suddenly they, they're chugging along thinking we're all on the same page of DI, we're doing all this. And then suddenly like, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> right, so just something to think about, okay? By the way, Brent, I'm not, I haven't been checking chat, so I don't know, you'll let me know if there's anything, okay. So now let's go to the practice of DI, right? So what do we mean by this? And in a way, I've already alluded to this earlier. So this is the way I formulated it. Uh, you know, it's a bit jargony. It's what, you know, but that's what I do. So it's the summation of activities and formal operational functions with any, any organization, for-profit, non-profit, public, that focuses on supporting diversity, DEI, with the goal of rectifying organizational discrimination and inequities, changing organizational culture, and contributing to societal change. So again, there are many levels to this, right? So it's fixing what needs to be fixed within your organization, but also this, to me, to me, this cannot be separated from societal change. And it goes back to the questions of the why, for whom, and how, because your organizations might decide like, wait, we just wanna focus on our organization. You know, and so, because if you're clear that you're just focusing on your organization, which is fine, then that will also define what actions you will take. But if you understand this work as being part of changing society and rectifying historic wrongs, then you know, your approach might be slightly different. What you invest in, in terms of programs and services, how you approach this, how you amplify your message might be a bit different, right? So, so the, anyway, this is what I mean by when you talk about DEI and the practice of DEI, and it's a, from an organizational perspective. Now, this is one thing that I just want, you know, as you go about your work doing DEI, to, to toggle between these different perspectives or units of analysis, right? Because an individual's understanding, meaning each and every member of your organization, will be different from the groups. And the groups could be your teams, it could be your entire department if you're really, really large organization or your entire organization, right? So, but to understand because you need to be clear and it's, it's part of management and leadership too, right? Understanding where is your staff member coming from and what motivates folks, what will make them succeed, what will make them thrive. So it's understanding as a leader, how does each, and again, this is about each individual. It's about everyone, right? And then if you're a team leader or an entire organization, how does that work? So it's always good to toggle among those different things because, you know, it's easy, right? In the day-to-day -day work, yeah, God knows. I know. I work for, for grassroots nonprofits, right? We, we have enough work just trying to get our work done in the day. But sometimes it's always good to reflect and see what are we doing here? Right. So even like when we have, okay, we're going to do this training or this workshop. Okay. Well, what are the implications or how should it be tailored for the different individual members of my team? What does it mean for the organization? So this is what I mean by being cognizant as leaders or even members of an organization of the different levels of understanding and being within an organization. All right. All right. So. 
let's you know let me open this up so i can take a break break for myself so what what are the arguments for diver diversity and you can answer this as an individual or as for the group organization any takers what are the arguments for and by the way diversity is the short for di Uh, this is Justin Pippins again here. I, I think the hey, I think the big argument is is if you look across the country, everybody's struggling to hire, everybody's struggling to find talent, yes. everybody's maxed out who they've hired. So diversity is the future of employment. I mean, we, yes. we've got to get out of our comfort zones and look in some different places. Um, yes. you know, um, just challenging yourself to, to go across the state or to a different town to find talent and just stop looking in your same, the same places that you're always looking for talent. So diversity to me is, is just being open, being curious, being thoughtful of how you're hiring, how you're finding talent. Does everybody look the same? You know, you know does everybody get along? Does every, right. Do you like working with the people yes. that you work with? So just being conscious of how you're moving your organization forward and is, is everybody moving forward or is someone poking holes in your boat? Yeah, thank you, Justin. Uh, you totally, you know, made, well, the deeper argument, but also the business argument, right? Uh, the reality is, look, this country is changing fast demographically. And, you know, uh, even understandings of the workplace and what people are looking for in the workplace have changed. And a lot of folks now, particularly as they get the young, younger generations, expect diversity, they expect equity and inclusion. So if you were to get, you know, talent and recruit folks and keep folks, as Justin has pointed out, that it's very important. Th thank you, Justin. Anyone else? Shannon? I think just to build on what uh, Justin spoke about, um, if you have a diverse workforce, you're going to be more successful uh, in the nonprofit realm or in the business realm yes. um, to sort of add on to making it work both internally, but also to expand and get different ideas for a broader um, a broader reach for your organization, whatever that organization is um into the world in a more fluid and cognizant way um you know and also hopefully happily <laughs> right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay well th thank you uh and i was like oh my gosh where did the time go we're already at 133 so, so i will at least try to get to the framework y'all uh but so I will just go through like the arguments here quickly, but this is an excellent source, by the way. And this book, it's from a global perspective. And I know the quote is from a for-profit person, but it still applies, right? That it's basically what was just said, that a diversified, diversified workforce, right, will, will actually strengthen the organization and help end of the day with, you know, everybody talks about ROI, what's the return on investment? But in our case, in our work, it's the communities we serve, right? So it helps. Now, I will go quickly through this. And as I said, we can dig into this in July. But there are different, you know, uh, for those of us in academia, like, of course, we, we like our theses and our arguments or what. But the, the short of this, all these seven hypotheses, uh, management and leadership hypotheses around why diversity is good, End of the day, if I were to, to, to summarize this, that it actually helps in productivity. It actually helps also in consumer satisfaction or the satisfaction of the communities you serve. And why? At the end of the day, it's because folks feel like they belong. And if people feel like they belong and they're valued, then they will be more productive, right? And if, if, if your team and everyone's productive, then you serve your communities and, and your uh, clientele better. So here, uh, this is another good study. McKinsey, by the way, and uh, does a lot of work around diversity, granted it's in the corporate sector. But the key takeaway here in a nutshell would be that the more diverse companies are, 
the more likely they'll outperform their, their peers. That's what these next few slides are about. Basically, they studied all the companies they work with, comparing those in the top uh, quartile, meaning those who really have more diversity in terms of gender and ethnicity versus those at the bottom quartile or the bottom 25%. And no surprise, those companies that are more diverse always outperforms those that are not. So the social science is out there uh, from organizational psychology to management, literature and all that. It's already been proven that when you have diverse organizations, it does help. There's still a lot of work to be done that when it comes to the more equitable and inclusive, but definitely it's already been proven diversity helps. Uh, so I'll just push, and this is just the reverse where it shows that if you're not, you're not as diverse, then you're not gonna perform as well. All right, let me just go through this. It just shows representation globally, and this is in the corporate sector. And what for me is striking about this slide is how even in the, you know, the progressive Nordic countries, they still have a ways to go in terms of representation among women. I know for us, for our sector, it's thank goodness a bit different in that sense, in the sense we have more women in our workforce in the nonprofit sector. However, we also know that when it comes to leadership positions, it's still not, you know, still a ways to go. And then if we were to talk about BIPOC uh, folks, definitely a whole lot of work to do in the nonprofit sector. All right, so I will breeze through this because I do want to go into the framework and quickly first about arguments against diversity, right? So I think, you know, it can lead to less cooperation or coordination, right? Because the reality is if we all come from different perspectives and backgrounds, unless we learn how to really work with each other and hear each other and talk to each other, it can be, you know, uh, there can be conflict. It is a fact, right? Uh, then the good thing is, yes, there'll be more information and perspectives, but it might take longer to come to a decision. And particularly in our sector, we, we do value consensus, right? I mean, one would hope that it's not too top down and like the corporate sector. And then finally, as I alluded to, difficulty in communicating, coordinating. Yeah, but, but I would argue though, while this is true and valid, that there are ways to mitigate this, right? And then that's part of how do we learn to communicate and lead diverse teams, all right. So let me go on. So can another, oh, here's an important thing. I better not jump through this quickly. Brent, I might go over 40 minutes. I hope it's that okay. <laughs> so can another case be made for, di for diversity? And actually the answer is yes. And what is the argument? Basically, because it's the right thing to do. It's the moral argument that, you know, there's a lot of work to be done. And so what's interesting, so this is actually based on a study of six studies and focusing on the diversity rhetoric of communications, meaning where folks use the business argument, right, uh, in their corporate communications where, you know, they, they diversity, diversity is great because it helps with the uh, company's bottom line. And there are those who actually say no, because it's on moral grounds, it's on fairness and equal opportunity. That's why we're doing this, right? So an example of uh, the rhetoric, as it were, would be this one from Tenet Healthcare. We embrace diversity because it is our culture and it is the right thing to do. So that's an example of a, uh, of a fairness case. Now, what's interesting about the study is this, well, maybe not surprising, 80% of organizations still use the business argument, which again, I'm not saying we should ignore. It's very valid. It, 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 the reality is a lot of folks to come over and, you know, you have to make this argument, right? Because particularly the corporate sector, it's about making money, then you have to make that argument. But I know even in some of our boards, right? You have to convince, particularly those who come from corporate that like, well, actually, you know, it, it helps, right? So sometimes you do have to use that business argument, but it doesn't mean that you can, that it's not an either or. I'd argue that we need to get into a language that it's the fair and the right thing to do. So, and then just to consider when earlier Justin was talking about recruiting, retention, and retainment. So for candidates, potential candidates, and this would be diverse candidates, so 
candidates who read a business case compared to those who read a neutral messaging, 27% were concerned about stereotyping because you know there there are there is pressure. I feel that myself as a minority, like among full-time faculty, for instance, we have 47 full-time faculty of whom seven are of color or or, uh, or identify as a woman. So I do, I'm, I am concerned about stereotyping and will I feel like I belong? So when you have candidates who see like, oh, it's about the business case, well, will I be the, you know, the whatever that I, I need to represent my people, I need, you know, all that. And then 20.1% are concerned that they would be seen as interchangeable. Sadly, I personally have experienced that. Oh, you, you know, tell me all about the Asian people <laughs> or, or tell me all about the gay people. Um, yeah, not good. All right. So I guess what ultimately what I'm trying to say is that there are many arguments that can be made, but, but this is where I think sometimes we have to be pragmatic. Consider who you're trying to convince. And sometimes for some, it's the business case. But I do wish most, if not all of us, really saw that it's the right thing to do. Okay. So I did get to this and, you know, I'll, I'll just go to this and afterwards or pause for questions and because I would like to give time for Q&A. Uh, but as I said, you know, if you, if, if I haven't scared you yet and you decide to come back on July 28, I promise to really dive into so many things. Um, but this is the framework that I, I offer my class and anyone who's interested is so you, whether or not your organization has a DEI practice or started one, I would still argue if you haven't, is to actually take a pause and start the top awareness. So to actually gather data and data here is not just demographics, but also like what are your policies and processes? What are the attitudes? What are the perceptions of your team members as well as other stakeholders? So in a way, so you know where you're starting at. Because otherwise, we're just tossing like, oh, okay, we need trainings, we need this, we need that. But why, right? So you have to be strategic before you go into the tactics, right? So understand. So I always start with awareness. So taking the pause and looking at where are you at as an organization when it comes to DEIB, right? So let's add the B there because I, I strongly believe in that too. Then from awareness, now, once you know where you're going, so this is you know strategic planning, right? Then you go into action. What actions do you need to take to change? It's about organizational change management, right? So what is your strategy? How are you gonna, and then once you've got your strategy, you implement it. Once you implement it, you make sure you evaluate it, right? And then how do you sustain it, right? So if, for instance, very obvious one, if you find out that, you, you only have, oh, I don't know, I'm just tossing this, like only 20% women, which I hope is not the case, then clearly one thing you need to do is to have more women, right? Or if you're in a predominantly BIPOC community, but your leadership and your staff are predominantly white, then you know what, where you need to work on, what you need to work on. And so that's implementation, then make sure you evaluate that, make sure it's sustainable. And then the third part, which I think is very important, is amplification. And this is internal and external communications. Internal because you need the rest of your organization to know what's going on and make sure that everyone really buys into this and believes in the mission. Because oddly enough, there would be a case where, actually in my own school at SPS, actually our numbers, just demographics and everything, it's like most of our leadership are women, predominantly women are what, uh, and we do have, you know, queer people and all that, but there's still a percentage that still feel that we need work to be done. So what's going on there, right? Is it a matter of communications or something deeper? So that's why amplification is important within. And remember what I said earlier, where I really believe that this work has a lot to do with our collective work in society. So it's how do you amplify this work, not just to promote your organization, but as individuals, as your employees go out into the world, as your clients go out, are they, in a way, is, are the ripples going out? So that's what uh, amplification is. And then eventually you go back. But here's the thing. It's a not, not a one-shop deal. We have a CDO. We have these trainings and workshops. It doesn't stop there. 
you always have to, as with anything, very basic, this is the data professor and me coming out, you have to go back and again measure, are we you know, meeting our KPIs and what have you? So it's 145, I can go on and I have more slides, which you have, <laughs> uh, but I will pause and see if there are any questions at this point, because I want to open it up. And if really there, there isn't any questions, then I will go on with my slides. <laughs> no, Erwin, this is, this is a good spot to um, start to gather questions. We have a, a couple here and, okay. and please pop them into the chat. So Leslie asks, if you have a small yeah. organization, it's not as diverse as you'd like, how do you implement DEIB actions if you don't have the ability to expand your staff to include a more diverse uh, hiring? E excellent question. And um, I will borrow from uh, Lili Zeng. Uh, there's this wonderful group book called DEI Deconstructed. I highly recommend it. I highly recommend it. And it Trust me, she doesn't know me. I don't know her, <laughs> but it's a very good book. But but her point is that, look, the reality is we can't really have, really can't represent everyone, right? But what she says is that even if you can't represent each one, everyone, at least the, the, the leadership and the staff that, okay, let me backtrack, look at the other way, but those who belong to marginalized uh identity said community can at least trust whoever is in place. So in this case, leadership and practitioners that they have everyone's best interest in mind that they can represent, right, folks. So for instance, in my case, I clearly identify as API, I'm Filipino, I'm an immigrant. I hope that other BIPOC folks in my, in my organization trust that I can you know, have their best interests in mind. So Leslie, I think to answer your question, it's that number of things, make sure that your staff, your organization is, you know, is highly like, that, that they understand what do we mean by this, but also deep understanding, right? About the history and all that. So they know how to speak, or at least there's a sensitivity. And part of it is making sure that it's seen in their actions, right? And part of this is really reaching out like from your uh, clients and your communities, do they trust you? And here's the thing, right? I mean, it's just the reality of our, 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 our country right now in society. The reality is just because an organization is, you name it, predominantly white or whatever, it doesn't mean that, that this organization can't work on behalf of a BIPOC community. I'll be the first one to say no. But if you have the capacity, the wherewithal, of course, work on it. But if you can't, uh, I do that, Leslie. I, I hope that's helpful. Let me see. Then we have Catherine here. Have there been any studies comparing the effectiveness of DI initiatives and organization with Intel versus those who had facilitated by? Ah, good. Actually, you know, there are. And in the slides that you'll get, <laughs> if you go, you know, you'll get my whole slide deck. There's this whole thing around trainings and workshops. <laughs> and that was, I was supposed to go into that. So yes, there are a lot of social science studies. And then actually there's a couple that HBR, Harvard Business Review came up like a good synopsis, an, a, you know, a big summary about trainings and workshops, effectiveness, et cetera, and all that. My only, now as a methodologist, you know, I, I always like but have this warning that we all have to remind ourselves that all these studies, no matter how scientific, right, social science and of that, it's still very limited. So you have to take in context what's the sample size, you know, what are they exactly focusing on? Because when you really dig into these academic articles, you'll even notice that they're looking at different aspects of the practice of DEI and trainings and workshops. So my, but here's a quick takeaway, and I really encourage you all to, to look what, uh, if that's your thing, you enjoy reading dense uh, articles is to go for it. But I would say, first of all, there's no one silver bullet for any organization. It's very context specific. So like there are certain things we all can do, but the question is like, that's why it's very important again to go back to know what are, where are you starting at? what will move the needle as it were. So I wish I could say do six trainings or do, no, 
you, you re, it has to be very thoughtful. It should be part of your strategic planning, frankly. Okay, let me see. Anything else? Um, I have a question for you, Erwin. Yes, and, friend. Um, so in, in thinking about, and you are just speaking to the fact that we're all at different points in our discussion around this. Right. Some of our organizations are really deep in it and have really worked, right. worked on it. Others, frankly, are just starting or, or they're just, hey, I heard this thing. Maybe right. we should think about it. Yeah. Do you have any examples of, of really effective practice of uh, an organization, I'll, I'll pick on boards. If anybody's a board member here, I'm sorry <laughs> to do this. Um, I put it in the chat, but I sort of find <laughs> that that boards might be at a different place on the continuum than maybe staff in in organizations. How do you, you know, examples of of how to to start these these discussions at a deeper level in in the boardroom? Oh, I have a good one. Uh, well, first of all, yes, actually, not that I'm privileging the board, but the reality is it has to at least start to emanate from the board because as we know, the board decides, right, uh, everything. So it's very important that the board really understands what they're doing. So a good example of this is uh, the LGBTQ Center right here in New York that I just started working with. Uh, so with their working group, I'm not a member of the board. They threatened to take me in, but I go, I don't know if you if you wanted me to do that. But in the meantime, I'm with the working group. And the reason they decided to have a working group, because even if they've done this whole DI initiative and all that, they realize they still have a whole lot of work to do. Meaning even understanding, individual understanding, and as a group about what do we mean by this, but also the history behind it uh, in society, in the organization, in New York, and then also learning how to be able to speak to each other and feeling safe. So I think one, so that's a good example. And I'd argue, argue actually, it's very important that the board and the leadership, meaning the C-suite, again, I know it depends on the size of the organization, right? But that's one of the key, if I were to be asked, like, yeah, I could list off a number of key elements that you need to have a successful DI, right? And it depends, of course, on what amounts of what. But a non-negotiable would be a commitment from an educated board and leadership. So it's not just commitment, but I tossed in educated, right? Because some of us might think like, well, Okay, and, and I'm still, by the way, I'll be the first one. I'm still being schooled by the younger ones. God knows. I put my foot in my mouth and thank goodness for younger ones who've been very gracious to me. It, this happened fairly, you know, Brent knows, you know, all this. Uh, but the reality is just because we, we feel like, I'll speak for myself, right? I, I, I was a student activist in the Philippines, came here, I've always been, you know, I like to think of myself as an activist, an ally, an advocate, but I still trip. And so just because you name it, or like, well, I, I marched with whomever in the 60s, doesn't mean you know everything. I don't. So the thing here is that the constant education, because things are changing, understandings are changing, language is changing. So it takes a certain humility and commitment. Yeah, because it's not a one-shot deal for everyone. So I, yeah, anyway, I went off. But Brad, absolutely, it's important to have leadership that's educated and committed. Well, and here's so sort of talking about boards, and and Heather has an excellent question. So, is there a framework for having client representation on our boards of directors? Sort of inclusive, uh, inclusive uh, boards. Um, yeah, you know, this is where if I were teaching. <laughs> A capstone project, you know, it really depends on and and you know what what kind of governance do you have for your organization, right? What kind of boards do you want? And that's really there's it depends, right? In my ideal world, my ideal world, of course, the board would include folks we're serving, right? I mean, but at the same time, I realize that nonprofits are set up in different ways depending on the size, depends on the tradition, depends on what. So, but it goes back again. If, yes, ideally have someone in your board. If that's not possible, but are they, are the communities you're serving, are you really hearing them or are they able to get their messages through? Because one thing that we all love to do, 
just as a checkbox would be, let's have an advisory board. Let's have our junior board. Let's have blah, 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 which is a great concept, but how much influence do they have? So, you know, so however your organization decides to do it, whether you actually have someone sitting, because the reason I say that, you know, let's be honest, like with some boards, you have someone because they can most, actually what we say in our capstone, make sure it's a working board, right? Because at least folks can either bring in the money or bring in the expertise. I get that. I respect that. But again, it goes back to, are you really hearing your staff, the people you serve, and the communities in which you sit? And, and Janelle has a, a very topical uh, mm -hmm. question about uh, kind of the legislative scene uh, <laughs> in Florida just just oh. this week. Uh, Governor DeSantis uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. signed the bill to, to um, prohibit funding for DEI. Yeah. I know here in Missouri yeah. that actually uh, yeah. died uh, this past week as a, a law, but right. certainly uh, on the agenda. Sadly... It might have died now, Brent, but I'm not too optimistic. Um, and the thing is, you know, corporates are lucky because they don't depend on government funding. If your nonprofit doesn't, then good for you. And if you really believe in this, because then you can easily find folks who are willing to do this work. I mean, at least to support it and not be scared away by DEI. I think the challenge now would be for those of you who do get state funding, right? Particularly from states that are against DEI. And that's where you really should start planning and looking at your portfolio and seeing if you're so heavily dependent on government funding, which I know happens, what can we do here? How can we mitigate this? Hmm. Sorry, I wish I had better news, but, or maybe just, but, but corporates are rather woke. And I embraced the term. <laughs> uh, but anyway, hey, Brent, I know we've got three minutes. I don't know if you wanted to, because uh, I'll, I'll shut up and let you talk. No, no, exactly, Erwin. So you're going just where I, I wanted to go, which is we have one final poll question for everybody about topics for J July 28th. Uh, Mark will will open up the, the poll right now. Um, use the other section if there's one not on here and you, you'd like to see it uh, covered on July 28th. We want to meet you where where you want to be, um, and so certainly want want to include that. Um, and and while we're we're doing this uh, again, I know I've, I sound like a huckster. I keep on uh, talking about the July twenty eighth event, but I really do uh, want and encourage you to share this with your your colleagues um, and certainly with board members too. Um, we would really appreciate having board members there to, to sort of dig into some of this material. Um, and we do it in a way that's not doctrinaire. We're not educating. We're having effective uh, conversations um, amongst all of us. Um, so we really appreciate that. Uh, at this point, uh, I want to thank Erwin. Please do keep on popping in the, the polls. Yeah. This is absolutely wonderful. Um, and uh, I want to thank Erwin. We're going to send out some information about July 28th. We're also going to have a box folder for everybody with resources um, for you to, to also dig in on this. We're always here for you. And I imagine Erwin would, would be happy to, uh, to answer any questions you might have if, if you reach out to, to him and we'll, we'll be able to provide that contact info. Yes. So, uh, thank you, Erwin.